Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose Changer Pat. That's me, in case you're wondering. Today we're reading Chapter 12 of Queen of Sorcery by David Eddings, and as always, you should support the original work by buying the original book. Chapter 12. A brassy chorus of horns saluted them from the battlements of Vomimber as they rode out of the city, accompanied by two score armored knights and by King Corridolan himself. Garion glanced back once and thought he saw the Lady Narina standing upon the wall above the arched gate, though he could not be sure. The Lady did not wave, and Mandarallan did not look back. Garion, however, very nearly held his breath until Vomimber was out of sight. It was mid-afternoon by the time they reached the ford which crossed the river Erend into Talnidra, and the bright sun sparkled on the river. The sky was very blue overhead, and the colored pennons on the lances of the escorting knights snapped in the breeze. Garion felt a desperate urgency, an almost unbearable necessity, to cross the river and to leave Arendia, and the terrible things that had happened there behind. Hail and farewell, holy Belgarath, Coradolin said at the water's edge. I will, as thou hast advised me, begin my preparations. Arendia will be ready. I pledge my life to it. And I'll keep you advised of our progress from time to time, Mr. Wolf said. I will also examine the activities of the Mergos within my kingdom, King Corridolan said. If what thou hast told me should prove true, as I doubt not that it shall, then I will expel them from Arendia. I will seek them out, one and all, and harry them out of the land. It will make, I will make their lives a burden and an infliction to them for sowing discord and contention among my subjects. Wolf grinned at him. That's an idea that appeals to me. Mergos are an arrogant people, and a little affliction now and then teaches them humility. He reached out and took the king's hand. Goodbye, Corridolan. I hope the world's happier next time we meet. I will pray that it may be so, the young king said. Then Mr. Wolf led the way down into the rippling water of the shallow ford. Beyond the river, Imperial Tolnidra waited, and from the banks behind them, the Mimbrate knights saluted with a great fanfare on their horns. As they emerged on the far side of the river, Garion looked around, trying to see some difference in terrain or foliage which might distinguish Arendia from Talnidra. But there seemed to be none. The land, indifferent to human boundaries, flowed on unchanged. About a half mile from the river, they entered the forest of Vordu, an extensive tract of well-kept woodland which extended from the sea to the foothills of the mountains to the east. Once they were under the trees, they stopped and changed back into their traveling clothes. I think we might as well keep the guise of merchants, Mr. Wolf said, settling with obvious comfort back into his patched rust-colored tunic and mismatched shoes. It won't fool the Grolems, of course, but it will satisfy the Talnidrids we meet along the way. We can deal with Grolems in other ways. Are there any signs of the orb about? Beric rumbled as he stowed his bearskin cloak and helmet in one of the packs. A hint or two, Wolf said, looking around. I guess that Zadar went through here a few weeks ago. We don't seem to be gaining on him very much, Silk said, pulling on his leather vest. We're holding our own, at least. Shall we go? They remounted and continued along the Tolnedron Highway, which ran straight through the forest in the afternoon sun. After a league or so, they came to a wide place in the road where a single whitewashed stone building, low and red-roofed, stood solidly at the roadside. Several soldiers lounged indolently about, but their armor and equipment seemed less well cared for than that of the legionnaires Garion had seen before. Custom station, Silk said. Talnadrons like to put them far enough from the border so that they don't interfere with legitimate smuggling. Those are very slovenly legionnaires, Dernick said disapprovingly. They aren't legionnaires, Silk explained. They're soldiers of the customs service, local troops. There's a great difference. I can see that, Dernick said. A soldier wearing a rusty breastplate and carrying a short spear stepped into the road and held up his hand. Customs inspection, he announced in a bored tone. His Excellency will be with you in a moment or two. You can take your horses over there. He pointed to a kind of yard at the side of the building. Is trouble likely? Mandarallan asked. The knight had removed his armor and now wore the mail shirt and surcoat in which he customarily traveled. No, Silk said. The customs agent will ask a few questions, and then we'll bribe him and be on our way. 
Bribe? Durnick asked. Silk shrugged. Of course. That's the way things are in Talnidra. Better let me do the talking. I've been through all this before. The customs agent, a stout balding man in a belted gown of a rusty brown color, came out of the stone building, brushing crumbs from the front of his clothes. Good afternoon, he said in a businesslike manner. Good day, your excellency, Silk replied with a brief bow. And what have we here? The agent asked, looking appraisingly at the packs. I'm Radek of Boktor, Silk replied, a Drasnian merchant. I'm taking Sidarian wool to Tal Hanith. He opened the top of one of the packs and pulled out a quarter of gray woven cloth. Your prospects are good, worthy merchant, the customs agent said, fingering the cloth. It's been a chilly winter this year, and wool's bringing a good price. There was a brief clinking sound as several coins changed hands. The custom agent smiled then, and his manner grew more relaxed. I don't think we'll need to open all the packs, he said. You're obviously an honorable man, worthy Radek, and I wouldn't want to delay you. Silk bowed again. Is there anything I should know about the road ahead, Your Excellency? He asked, tying up the pack again. I've learned to rely on the advice of custom service. The road's good, the agent said with a shrug. The legions see to that. Of course. Any unusual conditions anywhere? It might be wise if you kept somewhat to yourselves on your way south, the stout man advised. There is a certain amount of political turmoil in Talnidra just now. I'm sure, though, that if you show that you're tending strictly to business, you won't be bothered. Turmoil, Silk asked, sounding a bit concerned. I hadn't heard about that. It's the succession. Things are a bit stirred up at the moment. Is Ran Varun ill? Silk asked with surprise. No, the stout man said. Only old. It's a disease no one recovers from, since he doesn't have a son to succeed him. The Barun dynasty hangs on his feeblest breath. The great families are already maneuvering for position. It's all terribly expensive, of course, and we tall Nidrans get agitated when there's money involved. Silk laughed briefly. Don't we all? Perhaps it might be to my advantage to make a few contacts in the right quarters. Which family would you guess is in the best position at the moment? I think we have the edge over the rest of them, the agent said rather smugly. We? The Vorduvians. I'm distantly related on my mother's side to the family. The Dr Grand Duke Kador of Tol Vordu is the only logical choice for the throne. I don't think I know him, Silk said. An excellent man, the agent said expansively. A man of force and vigor and foresight. The selection were based on simple merit. Grand Duke Kador would be given the throne by general consent. Unfortunately, though, the selection's in the hand of the Council of Advisors. Ah. Indeed, the agent agreed bitterly. You wouldn't believe the size of the bribes some of these men are asking for their votes worthy, Radek. It's an opportunity that comes only once in a lifetime, I suppose, Silk said. I don't begrudge any man the right to a decent, reasonable bribe, the stout agent complained. But some of the men on the council have gone mad with greed. No matter what position I get in the new government, it's going to take me years to recoup what I've already been obliged to contribute. It's the same all over Talnidra. Decent men are being driven to the wall by taxes and all these emergency subscriptions. You don't dare let a list go by that doesn't have your name on it, and there's a new list out every day. The expense is making everyone desperate. They're killing each other in the streets of Tal Haneth. That bad? Silk asked. Worse than you can imagine, the custom man said. The Horbites don't have the kind of money it takes to conduct a political campaign, so they're starting to poison off council members. We spend millions to buy a vote, and the next day our man turns black in the face and falls over dead. Then we have to raise more millions to buy up his successor. They're absolutely destroying me. I don't have the right kind of nerves for politics. Terrible, Silk sympathized. If Ran Baroon would only die, the Tal Nidran complained desperately. We're in control now, but the Hanus are richer than we are. If they unite behind one candidate, they'll be able to buy the throne right out from under us. And all the while, Ran Baroon sits in the palace, doting on that little monster he calls a daughter, and with so many guards around that we can't persuade even the bravest assassin to make an attempt on him. Sometimes I think he intends to live forever. 
Patience, Excellency, Slick advised. The more we suffer, the greater the rewards in the end. The tall Nidran sighed. I'll be very rich someday then, but I've kept you long enough, worthy Radek. I wish you good speed in cold weather in tall Haneth to bring up the price of your wool. Silk bowed formally, remounted his horse, and led the party at a trot away from the customs station. It's good to be back in Tall Deidre again, the weasel-faced little man said expansively once they were out of earshot. I love the smell of deceit, corruption, and intrigue. You're a bad man, Silk, Beric said. This place is a cesspool. Of course it is, Silk allowed, but it isn't dull, Beric. Talnidra is never dull. They approached a tidy Talnidran village as evening fell and stopped for the night in a solid, well-kept inn where the food was good and the beds were clean. They were up early the next morning. After breakfast, they clattered out of the inn yard and onto the cobbled stone street in the curious silver light that comes just before the sun rises. A proper sort of place, Dernick said approvingly, looking around at the white stone houses with their red-tiled roofs. Everything seems neat and orderly. It's a reflection of the tall Nidran mind, Mr. Wolf explained. They pay great attention to details. That's not an unseemly trait, Dernick observed. Wolf was about to answer that when two brown-robed men ran out of the shadowy side street. Look out! The one in the rear yelled. He's gone mad! The man running in front was clutching at his head, his face contorted into an expression of unspeakable horror. Garion's horse shied violently as the madman ran directly at him, and Garion raised his right hand to try to push the bulging-eyed lunatic away. At that instant his hand touched the man's forehead, he felt a surge in his hand, an arm, a kind of tingling as if the arm were suddenly enormously strong, and his mind filled with a vast roaring. The madman's eyes weren't blank, and he collapsed on the cobblestones as if Garion's touch had been some colossal blow. Then Beric nudged his horse between Garion and the fallen man. What's this all about? He demanded of the second road man who ran up gasping for breath. We're from Merterin, the man answered. Brother Obor couldn't stand the ghosts anymore, so I was given permission to bring him home until his sanity returned. He knelt over the fallen man. You didn't have to hit him so hard, he accused. I didn't, Garion protested. I only touched him. I think he fainted. You must have hit him, the monk said. Look at the mark on his face. An ugly red welt stood on the unconscious man's forehead. Garion, Aunt Paul said, can you do exactly what I tell you to do without asking any questions? Garion nodded. I think so. Get down off your horse, go to the man on the ground, and put the palm of your hand on his forehead, then apologize to him for knocking him down. Are you sure it's safe, Polgar? Beric asked. It'll be all right. Do as I told you, Garion. Garion hesitantly approached the stricken man, reached out, and laid his palm on the ugly welt. I'm sorry, he said, and I hope you get well soon. There was a surge in his arm again, but quite different from the first one. The madman's eyes cleared, and he blinked. Where am I? he asked. What happened? His voice sounded very normal, and the welt on his forehead was gone. It's all right now, Garion told him, not knowing exactly why he said it. You've been sick, but you're better now. Come along, Garion, Aunt Paul said. His friend can care for him now. Garion went back to his horse, his thoughts churning. A miracle! the second monk exclaimed. Hardly that, Aunt Paul said. The blow restored your friend's mind, that's all. It happens sometimes. But she and Mr. Wolf exchanged a long glance that said quite plainly that something else had happened. Something unexpected. They rode on, leaving the two monks in the middle of the street. What happened? Dernick asked, a stunned look on his face. Mr. Wolf shrugged. Polgara had to use Garion, he said. There wasn't time to do it any other way. Dernick looked unconvinced. We don't do it often, Wolf explained. It's a little cumbersome to go through someone else like that, but sometimes we don't have any choice. But Garion healed him, Dernick objected. It had to come from the same hand as the blow, Dernick, Aunt Paul said. Please don't ask so many questions. The dry awareness in Gar Garion's mind, however, refused to accept any of their explanations. It told him that nothing had come from outside. With a troubled face, he stood studied the silvery mark on his palm. It seemed different for some reason. Don't think about it, dear, Aunt Paul said quietly as they left the village and rode south along the highway. It's nothing to worry about. I'll explain it all later. 
Then, to the caroling of birds that greeted the rising sun, she reached across the and firmly closed his hand with her fingers.